Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Griffith Observatory's Winter Solstice 2021 live event. We're really happy you could join us here today. Um, we're going to tell you all about what's happening today, what defines the winter solstice. Uh, we have a special presentation by our very own observatory director, Dr. Krupp. Um, Patrick's going to speak a little bit about why today's the solstice, what the sunlight's doing, the shadow's doing. And then also, provided, I'm looking out my window now, provided the sun cooperates and the clouds cooperate, we will bring you the live local noon transit at our very own Gottlieb Transit Corridor. Now, today's event is brought to you by the City of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and of course, Griffith Observatory, which is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles. We also want to thank our nonprofit partner, Griffith Observatory Foundation, which, um, as you know, you can make donations through our YouTube page. I believe this is another event that you can do that, and we appreciate all the donations. Now, moving onward about what's happening today, um, by the way, I'm Dr. David Reitzel. I think I forgot to mention that. I'm the astronomical lecturer here at Griffith Observatory. Well, first of all, I've got a little model Earth here, and I've put a pole on it, a cleverly a pencil there. Now, a lot of people think the Earth goes through space doing this, and that's why we have seasons. They'll say, well, the pole tips. It tilts back and forth. That's not so correct, actually. Our pole, while it does sort of wobble like a top, that wobbling motion takes tens of thousands of years. It's like 27,000 years to make a wobble. So you won't notice that motion during your lifetime. So more or less, that pole is pointing the same direction in space your whole life with a very small change. Now, what is happening is as the Earth orbits around the sun, that pole will be pointed sometimes towards the sun, if the sun's over here, or as it orbits around to the other side, magic comes in. Now the sunlight's coming from the other side. Um, it's pointed towards it. When it orbits, see, I knew I wouldn't be able to do this very well. Um, so this is why we have Patrick So here with us to show what's happening. Now today, this, because of this motion, because the tilt and the, oh, the motion of the earth around the sun, it's better if I use my fist to be the sun. Now it's pointed away from it. And as it orbits around, and on this side, now it's pointed towards it. So you can see what's happening there. And on today, on the solstice, that axis is on the part of the orbit where the North Pole is pointed away from the sun. And this causes a few things. It causes the sun to appear very low in the sky. It rises late. It rises far to the, it rises far to the north. And it'll set far to the north. And it won't be up very long. Um, so, Patrick, you're going to tell us a little bit more about this. And you can show us on a slide um, where the sun will be um, at local noon today, or, or where it was at least at the moment of the solstice. So I think that's the first slide you have. So take it away, Patrick. What, what are we dealing with today? All right. So uh, let, let's let's take a look at this slide that we um, started off with. <clears throat> uh, what we're looking at is uh, uh, we're in Los Angeles, and the sun is positioned at the exact moment, local noon, uh, just above the south horizon. Um, at the time of, of um, just after solstice. The solstice actually occurs at 7.59 a.m. So it's already occurred. And this is the point um, at which uh, the sun uh, rests on the most southern point on its annual path um, around the sky. Uh, this path is known as the ecliptic and it's marked there with the red line. Now the um, motion of the sun uh, along the ecliptic is caused uh, when the Earth moves in its orbit around the sun, making it appear that the sun travels along the sky, around the sky, along the ecliptic throughout the year. And um, when we reach uh, the December solstice, um, the sun is at its lowest point or its most southern point uh, along uh, the ecliptic. So at lo local noon, when the sun is directly above the south horizon, uh, the sun is at its lowest point in the sky. It's about 34 degrees in altitude above the south horizon. And uh, this is the lowest noontime altitude for the entire year. So after that, uh, the sun will uh, move along um, eastward along the ecliptic, and uh, it will climb a little bit higher each day at local noon. So um, today is the shortest day of the year, and uh, the and the longest night of the year, but uh, that will change as days go by um, after today. 
Now, another thing is that, um, as David was saying, that the north uh, pole of the earth is um, actually pointed, kind of tilt, tipped away from the, from the sun. Um, what does this mean? Well, the, it means that um, the sun is lower in the sky, as seen from Los Angeles or anywhere in the northern hemisphere. And it also, its rays are spread out um, uh, much, uh, much more over a wider area, so it feels cooler uh, uh, during the uh, winter months. And today is the start of the official start of northern winter here in the northern uh, hemisphere. And, but in the southern hemisphere, it's the start of summer. So it's actually summer solstice in the, uh, in the southern, hem southern hemisphere. So people are enjoying the first day of summer uh, out in the, um, in the southern hemisphere. But we are enjoying the first day of winter today. So uh, uh, that's what we have today. And um, we'll I'll hand it back to uh, David. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, I think my internet went a little unstable there. So if I, I disappear on you here, it's that our, my internet at the observatory is slightly unstable, I think. Anyway, well, thank you for that. That explained the pole being pointed. Now, keep in mind that axis of the Earth points the same direction. And as, it, as the Earth orbits the sun, that six months later, that North Pole will be pointed towards the sun and will experience the first day of summer. Now, autumn and spring... The first day of this is all northern hemisphere, by the way, I want to make sure it's clear the southern hemisphere is experiencing the opposite, the polar opposite, actually, um, events where the first day of winter up here is the first day of summer for southern hemisphere. So this is really the December solstice, as some folks like to call it, but we're in the northern hemisphere. It's the first day of winter up here. So you'll hear us call it the winter solstice a lot. Um, but we don't mean that anybody in the southern hemisphere isn't experiencing the first day of summer. For them down there, the South Pole is pointed towards the sun. They will experience very long days. The sun will be very high in the sky. The radiation coming from the sun is concentrated. Um, you can picture it as having a flashlight. And if you shine the flashlight straight down, it makes a very small spot on the ground. All the energy coming from that light bulb is illuminating that one small spot. The energy is being transferred from the flashlight to the ground. Well, a lot of it is scattered and bounced back to your eye, but you get the idea. The sun is doing the same thing. Here, the first day of winter, it's as low as in the sky as it'll get. It's like holding that flashlight at an angle and those beams are gonna be spread out and that energy is spread out across the ground. Not only that, um, so each little square inch is getting far less energy, so it's colder. We aren't gathering as much of the sunlight in our part of the world. And the sun is up less as well. The days are shorter. So we're definitely in that time of year where we're getting less energy from the sun than we're getting, than we're losing at night. Um, and, and that's why it's cooling off and it'll continue to do so while the days will start getting longer. So in some ways people go, oh, winter, first day of winter, it's a terrible thing. Well, keep in mind the days, the daylight has been getting shorter and shorter and shorter. After this, it's all more and more daylight. So we can start to enjoy the days again as they get longer. Um, it'll finally start to warm up again. Well, give it a few months. <laughs> so unfortunately, we're going to keep losing energy for the next couple of months. Um, and it will be winter and it's going to get colder. Um, so, but this is all how it works. And it's all due to the fact that we orbit the sun with a tilted pole. It isn't due to the fact that we're too close to the sun in summer and we're further from the sun in the winter. That is not how this works. Um, it happens, in fact, that we are closest to the sun. I'm forgetting the exact date. Patrick, it's January. It's around about January 4th when we're Fourth? closest. To, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. I was, I was going to say the 8th, but I was doubling the 4th for some reason. So we're actually closest to the sun in Northern Hemisphere winter. Yet that is a much smaller effect than the spread out sunlight due to the angle and the shorter days. So even though you might think, well, our winters, are they milder due to that? Well, there's other, other effects, things like ocean currents that can make things milder than even that little distance would be. So um, but that's what's happening today. We are experiencing our first day of Northern Hemisphere winter here at Griffith Observatory. And I'm looking outside again and I'm seeing clouds, to be honest. So I'm not sure we're going to actually experience our, our beam of sunlight activating our meridian arc in the, in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor. But that's part of the excitement with um, live observing and live events. 
I'm a, a observer myself as an astronomer. I did observations and you'd go to the telescope and you are at the mercy of those clouds. So um, Dr. Krupp, I'm afraid you are also at the mercy of these clouds today, but I'm glad that you have a presentation ready to go to tell us all about uh, the meaning behind today and, and what we're hoping to see. Now, I, I believe we even have a way to activate that arc should it be cloudy, but uh, maybe I should keep the magic behind the curtain until we're ready. But let me introduce our very own observatory director, um, Dr. Krupp, are you there with us? I think your camera just got turned off, I believe. I have returned. Thank there you are, perfect. Much. Anyway, introducing our drone director. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure as always. Thanks, Dr. Reitzel and, and uh, Patrick So as well. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today to Griffith Observatory Television. Uh, and I am seeking for a moment, there we are, uh, the, uh, the, the videos and the images that we need. Uh, I, I'm grateful that you all joined us on the winter solstice. And in particular, a uh, short time from now has been mentioned, uh, local noon in Griffith Observatory's Gottlieb Transit Corridor on the first day of winter, at least as you've heard in the Northern Hemisphere. I am Ed Krupp, director of Griffith Observatory. And as a prelude to local noon, we'll spend a little time uh, with the Meridian, which is inextricably linked with local noon. Today, local noon occurs at 11.51 a.m., 11.51.52 Pacific Standard Time. And as you heard, the exact moment of winter solstice occurred at 7.59 a.m. Pacific Standard Time earlier this morning, just about uh, four hours uh, ago. Uh, the weather is uh, perplexing at the moment, uh, but hope springs eternal, even if it's the first day of winter. And uh, there will be uh, sunlight of a sort no matter what. The meridian, of course, is uh, just a, a fundamental reference in our system of directions. It's just a line that runs on the ground from true north to true south, uh, much as you see in this diagram as you're looking north. And wherever you go, there you are on some uh, local uh, meridian. Uh, there's another one right there. Um, many uh, monumental antiquities were intentionally aligned with the meridian, and actually our maps are oriented uh, according to the meridian. That's just a map of, of Washington, D.C., with north at the top, south at the bottom. And the grid plans of many major cities are, are built to the meridian and the cardinal directions associated with it. The design of Griffith Observatory uh, actually adheres uh, to the meridian, and the uh, vertical line in this aerial view corresponds to that north-south line, and of course the axis of symmetry of the observatory. Well, the meridian originates in the basic behavior of the sky and is a fundamental astronomical reference. It's probably most familiar to most people as the prime meridian, uh, that's, of course, the meridian at Greenwich, England, and the Greenwich meridian serves as the adopted zero point for longitude on the Earth. It's a primary attraction at the old Royal Observatory at, at Greenwich uh, in, near London. People stand on the meridian, <clears throat> people sit on the meridian, people observe on the meridian. So the meridian is then the north-south line, and we identify those directions, north and south, through the most fundamental motion of the sky, its daily rotation, uh, which is uh, a product of the Earth's uh, spinning on its axis. Uh, this is just a time exposure of uh, the camera facing uh, that uh, northern part of the sky and the trails that the stars leave are a small part of what they would leave if you could leave that picture or that camera open for 24 hours. Of course, they uh, sun would come up in the morning and ruin the picture, but you can at least get the idea of that circular motion of those stars as they uh, they travel around that northern direction. And that entire northern sky seems to turn around a single unmoving spot in the sky. That's the North Celestial Pole. And Polaris, the pole star, star is, is fortuitously close to that position. The direction on the ground uh, directly below the North Celestial Pole, marked by that little black dot in the, in the diagram there, uh, that uh, is in, in fact uh, the uh, cardinal north or true north. Uh, and that's where the direction north originates. We, we wouldn't be talking about north if the world did not turn like this, but as the world turns, the sky delivers directions and people use the sky to establish their systems of directions. So as the sky rotates around the North Celestial Pole, 
the objects in the sky, the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, they all cross or transit the meridian. Here with a, a, a view of, of the Earth as if it were the center of the universe inside the globe of the sky, certainly not a physical reality, but kind of how it looks if you're on the surface of the Earth. And from this point of view, sort of outside of the sky, we see the sun over there on the right rising in the east and then beginning to climb an arc that crosses its highest point at the meridian and then goes down there in the west uh, at the horizon and, and disappears for the day. Well, all of the objects in, in the sky uh, do this, uh, but the, the word meridian is rooted in the words that mean midday or noon. And when the sun transits at local noon, uh, that's when the, the sun is at its highest point like this. So when the sun is east of the meridian, it is anti-meridium or AM before midday. When the sun is west of the meridian, it is post-meridium or PM or after midday. For the record, noon is neither AM nor PM, and the same is true for midnight. They're just noon and midnight. So the meridian is a time and also a place and also a direction. And the meridian is also that celestial arc that vaults the sky from the north point on the horizon through the zenith directly overhead to the south point on the horizon. And in fact, every month, astronomy magazines like Sky and Telescope publish an all-sky map equipped with a celestial meridian, the blue vertical line that bisects the chart from north to south, from the top to the bottom, with the zenith at the chart center is in fact the meridian line as it's mapped onto the sky chart. Now, from the surface of the earth, the distinction between north and south is profound. The stars travel in circles around the north celestial pole, but looking to the south, the stars appear to follow longer and flatter trajectories. They're still moving in circles, but the circles are much, much bigger compared to our perspective here on the surface of the Earth. And so their migration looks strikingly different, and people notice that different and create their direction systems, and sometimes according to what the, they see in the sky. Our ancestors were aware of these directional distinctions, and our ongoing use of them really is just a perpetuation of old habits. Uh, evidence of these habits shows up in many ancient and prehistoric uh, sites. For example, a natural rock shelter in Ventura County, California, a place called Alder Creek, is enriched with uh, Chumash pictographs. You're looking outside uh, the shelter in that view, and then inside, uh, up on the ceiling of the shelter, uh, Chumash California Indian pictographs uh, are, are all over that ceiling and elsewhere in the shelter. And they, the place seems to have been chosen for this symbolic enhancement because by chance it opens due north. When you're inside at night and looking out, you get a view of the north sky, the north star, and therefore the north celestial pole. And that point was of importance and significance to uh, those people and appears in fact to have been commemorated in their use of this rock shelter and the painting on the ceiling of the shelter which also is a huge piece of rock, but just with an accidental split, a fracture that cuts it in two. And that fracture also is like a line that points directly up to the North Pole of the sky, all by chance, but presumably noticed and taken advantage of by the people that lived in California. The same principle is deliberately expressed in monumental architecture in Chaco Canyon in Northwest New Mexico. Pueblo Benito, a large multi-story apartment you see here, uh, is a, a, a complex oriented with the meridian and it commemorates its orientation uh, in the north-south wall that bisects the two principal zones of the building's plaza. Uh, the plan is oriented with north at the top, south at the bottom. And, and if you look at that sort of half circle, there is a wall that just cuts it in half. And in fact, you can see that wall in the ruins uh, splitting one great kiva on one side uh, from the other great kiva or subterranean ceremonial chamber on the other. Beijing in the People's Republic of China is the only world capital that still adheres to a sacred cosmological plan. And during the Ming Dynasty, it was laid out on the meridian, the north-south line that's been preserved by the current regime. And the plan of the Imperial Palace or Forbidden City of Beijing shows its axial alignment with the north-south line in the diagram. It's apparent as well, just to the visitor, in the ritual walkway 
uh, to the Imperial Palace's Hall of Supreme Harmony. This line was focused on the emperor who held court in that hall, and he was the sky's agent on the earth, and he was the terrestrial counterpart to the North Celestial Pole. So just as all the stars circumambulated around the North Pole of the sky, the visible face of the high god Shangdi, the court circulated around the emperor. Migrating now to Egypt, Egypt's great pyramid at Giza and the rest of Egypt's pyramids are all cardinally oriented. A map of Giza again shows the sides of the pyramids corresponding to north and south and east and west uh, by the, the true directions. By incorporating cosmic order like this into monumental architecture, the Egyptians miniaturized the cosmos in a terrestrial setting and thereby turned it into sacred space. The observatory of Guosho Jing at, Gao, uh, at Gaocheng uh, is also uh, on a meridian axis that is established by that low wall in the foreground uh, that leads to the, the, the kind of pyramid structure that's built there. Uh, this is at a site in central China called Gaocheng, and the observatory operates like a sundial uh, to establish and refine the calendar with shadows that are cast along that low meridian wall. In the diagram, you can see the position of the sun high in the sky in summer, low in the sky in winter. Uh, they shine from two directions and then set out on the low wall, uh, two uh, different shadows of different lengths. And the measuring of those shadows enables the calendar to be determined. These principles were applied even more elaborately in the 14th century by the Islamic astronomer and ruler Ulug Beg at Samarkand in what is now Uzbekistan in Central Asia. He put an arc on his meridian to observe transits of the sun. Here are views of the remains of that meridian. Part of the, the underground part uh, still exists today, looking in one direction and looking in the other. Uh, but when it was fully operated, uh, an aperture up at the top uh, near the center of the arc would allow celestial objects either to be sighted or the sun to cast a beam onto the arc. And by measuring the angle, it was possible to determine, among other things, uh, where in the year we are. Europe developed its own calendrical uh, uh, revelations in architecture uh, with giant meridian scales that were installed in churches. Uh, you're looking, in fact, at the design of one of those, an elevation of one. Uh, and these were first intended to monitor the progress of the year calendrically. But eventually, these meridianas were inscribed on church floors by astronomers uh, to make precise measurements of the sun's daily noon elevation. So they were actually building astronomical instruments in churches in order to make observations. An aperture on the vertical wall rising beyond the, the south end of the calibrated meridian permits a pinhole image of the sun to cross the meridian each day uh, at local noon. So the, the, the pinhole in the diagram would be up high on that wall on the left, the sun shining through it, and where that beam goes depends, of course, on the angle, and its angle depends on where it is in the year. The uh, that angle uh, of the, the meridian line then uh, that gives the date allows the meridian uh, to work as a calendar and uh, this elevation illustrates the meridiana that was designed by Ignacio Dante in San Petronio in Italy. Uh, that's a 14th century Gothic basilica in Bologna done in, in 1575. Dante's San Petronio meridiana however was never completed uh, and it was replaced in 1655 uh, by a grander meridiana designed by the astronomer Gian Domenico Cassini. Cassini's 220 foot meridian is still embedded in the cathedral stone floor. And, and here's the sunlight crossing uh, the meridian at local noon on the 18th of November in 2004. Here now is a smaller one, but still works the same way. This is the meridiana in the old upper part of Bergamo in Northern Italy. And it's operating like clockwork in a public space on the 14th of October, 2009. And the spot of sunlight is marking that date. Of course, formal observations of the sun's meridian transits uh, persisted in national observatories like the Paris Observatory, a cornerstone of which was laid on the summer solstice in 1667 during the reign of Louis XIV. France adopted the axis of the Paris Observatory as its preferred primary meridian, no surprise there. 
Uh, Jean-Dominique Cassini was invited to Paris to assist the development of the new Paris Observatory. He became the first director. In extending the inquiry he had undertaken at San Petronio, he constructed a large meridiana in the Great Hall of the second floor of the Paris Observatory. It's 96 feet, 10 inches long. And he wanted the building to perform as an instrument and he designed his Meridiana to coincide with the Meridian of France, which just continues as a, a, a line that's marked on the ground, uh, on the observatory grounds, and, and, and continues off in, in the two directions. Well, with it, uh, Cassini planned to obtain more precise determinations of the apparent annual motion of the sun. Despite the French preference for the French prime meridian, the local Greenwich Meridian, occupied by George Airy's transit circle, was officially adopted as the prime meridian of the world in October 1884 at the International Meridian Conference held in Washington, D.C. Airy was England's astronomer royal, and his transit circle at the Greenwich Observatory was used in the service of British cartography. The old Royal Observatory had been established in 1675 by King Charles II, who wanted it dedicated, quote, to finding out the longitude of places for perfecting navigation and astronomy. Well, long before England and, and France drew a line in the land for zero degrees longitude, astronomy in medieval India staked out uh, a prime meridian claim through Ujjain, which is a city about 400 miles south of New Delhi. Ujjain is in central India. There's a plan of the Ujjain Observatory and the, the structure that's at the bottom of the plan is visible here. And that has meridian arcs on it and it's on a north-south line and it performed like these other uh, meridians. And the fact that it occupies the Tropic of Cancer, Ujjain was believed to be right on the Tropic of Cancer, uh, the 23 and a half degree latitude point on the earth. And that in part accounts for its status. Samajai Singh II, the Rajput ruler of Jaipur, built Ujjain in 1730 and four more monumental observatories. And his most elaborate observatory is in Jaipur. There, uh, the, the great Samrat Yantra makes sculpture and architecture out of an instrument. It includes a particularly interesting component, the Samhansa Yantra, uh, a cardinally oriented room that houses uh, the, uh, a pair of, of inscribed quadrants and permits light from the transiting sun to enter the room, the darkened chamber, through a pair of small holes. You see one of them there and the light beginning to hit the side of the wall. And in fact, there are both of the holes. And as the sun moves across above them, uh, those spots of light move over and across onto to the arcs that are inscribed there. And it's possible then to read the angle very accurately on, on both of those. So those pinhole images of the sun on the two quadrants permit the direct observation of the sun's astronomical declination, declination, which is linked to the calendar and the progress of the year. Well, there are all kinds of meridians around the world, but anyone who collects meridian markers now has to navigate a course to Los Angeles. Everybody knows about the Greenwich Meridian but this is the Griffith Meridian. Griffith Observatory is cardinally oriented. It faces north and its telescopes, of course, are aligned with the North Celestial Pole to facilitate continuous tracking of celestial objects. In fact, that's the Zeiss 12 inch refractor and it's pointed to the Northern sky uh, to a comet, in fact, that happens to be in view that was passing not far from the North Pole of the, the, the sky. The uh, uh, observatory, although it was conceived and, and constructed to conform to the needs of, of modern public astronomy, its Greek revival, Beaux-Arts modern architecture, reflects the traditional vision of cosmic order. It is, in fact, anchored to the cardinal directions. Telescopes operate on this principle. The telescope is rotated around its polar axis at a rate that compensates for the turning Earth. The sundial is also aligned with the meridian and that permits its shadows to convey time systematically on the ring. And the mirrors of Griffith Observatory's triple beam celestat or solar telescope are also on the meridian and they track the sun through the course of the day and provide direct observations of it. Well, the Griffith Meridian is actually part of a singular and monumental public instrument, the Gottlieb Transit Corridor. There's nothing else like it anywhere in the world. 
This instrument is integrated into the observatory's new architecture on the west side, where it's parallel glass walls, 150 feet long, 20 feet high. You're looking to the north there. Preserve below grade the observatory's signature vista of the western horizon. When we were putting new walls in place, we didn't want them to block the view, and so we made them out of glass. This instrument demonstrates how the sky works through the meridian transits of the sun, moon, and stars over the walled corridor. And the corridor, 10 feet wide, is bisected by the bronze meridian line set into the concrete floor. It extends the full length of the walls, which, which frame the celestial meridian, and therefore turn what's an astronomical abstraction into a real visual experience. The architecture then reveals the astronomy. At the north end, the meridian line climbs a stairway that's constructed to ascend at the same angle as the angle of the North Celestial Pole. So at night, visitors can sight the North Star along that stairway's central banister. The fundamental character of Griffith Observatory is indicated really right on the front of the building. If you look very carefully at those letters above the, the north door, uh, they say, those bronze letters declare Griffith Observatory. It's an observatory and it puts people eyeball to the universe. Well, Griffith Observatory is a public observatory and the building is filled with instruments. All of them deliver real data and real experiences and transform visitors into observers of nature and the sky through instruments. So we are here mobilized by the concept of the building as instrument. And the Gottlieb Transit Corridor is just another dimension of that immersive encounter with the sky. And there's more to it than just the, the, the long glass corridor, the north stairway, and the bronze meridian line. At the south end of the, the transit corridor, you can see there's a, like a vertical pillar off in the distance, and a tall night black monolith there actually supports a stainless steel foil. Uh, a closer view shows the black monolith and, of course, that stainless foil uh, that's uh, mounted to the top. And on the ground, just north of the monolith, stands a massive and inscribed uh, bronze and stainless steel uh, meridian arc. The Above that meridian arc, on the inside face of the glass wall, to the left in this view, on the west, is mounted a huge and heavy ecliptic chart. That is a star chart that shows the constellations that flank the path of the sun through the course of the year. The foil attached to the monolith is equipped with a complicated and technically advanced device. It's a hole. And an object, say the sun, transits the, the corridor, its light passes through the hole. And where that light falls, again, depends on the angle the object makes with the horizon, just as we've seen in some of the meridianas and some of the other uh, uh, monuments that uh, we've had a chance to examine so far. An object then reaches, as you've heard, its highest elevation when it transits and when the sun transits its local noon. Well, the monolith and the foil permit light from the transiting sun to strike the meridian arc where the sun's image, uh, which is about three inches in diameter, announces the date on a scale that's inscribed with the months and the days and the corresponding ecliptic constellation figures, that is the constellations through which the sun passes over the course of the year. And there are special emblems also on that arc that mark the solstices, the equinoxes, and the major standstills of the moon which are part of a much longer astronomical cycle uh, that the moon uh, participates in. People actually just walk inside the transit corridor and they watch all of this. Uh, they can also watch it from the terrace above. And uh, we perform uh, the, the local noon ceremony then uh, every day at Griffith Observatory. Now, actually, Tycho Brahe did something like this in 1582 he fabricated and installed a large bronze engraved meridian arc for transit observations in Uraniborg, uh, the castle observatory he built on the island of Aven off of Denmark. 
And this uh, diagram, the picture really of uh, part of his uh, observatory uh, shows the uh, image of that meridian arc, that golden arc uh, and Tycho in the background uh, making observations. So we have then uh, linked uh, the uh, meridian arc uh, with uh, where the sun makes its daily noon transit with the, the big star chart on the wall. And this is, uh, this is a little different from Tycho. Uh, we've got the meridian arc, uh, the spot of sunlight. In this case, you can see the sun shining almost directly down at the bottom of the arc. This is a view at summer solstice when the sun is at its highest point in the sky at local noon. But we now take that meridian arc and we link it up to the chart that you can see more easily in this view with the undulating curve going through it, which does mark the path of the sun. And a closer view of that would show you the, the constellations through which that, uh, that ecliptic uh, line passes. The way we've connected this though, allows the sun's light when it reaches the center line to activate the ecliptic chart. So the sun first edges, that is that pinhole image of the sun first edges onto the arc. And then as the sun continues to move toward the west, the circle or disc moves more toward the east and closer to that center line on the arc. When it actually gets to the center of the arc, it is marking a uh, local noon, but you can see a, a line of little dark dots that run all up and down that arc. Those are in fact sensors built into the arc. And when the sunlight actually connects with those sensors, when they pick up the light hitting them, they transmit a signal to the giant ecliptic arc overhead. And that signal then prompts the illumination of lights that mark the current position of the sun on the ecliptic, as well as the stars of the constellation uh, that the sun is occupying at that time. And in this particular case, when the picture was taken, the sun was in the constellation of Taurus the bull. And so those five little dots mark the, the luminous image of the sun on the chart, as well as uh, you can see stars lighting, uh, lighting up on the face and horns of Taurus the bull. So the meridian is a place and a time and a direction. And when visitors arrive at this junction of earth and sky, they occupy a place where space begins. It's kind of a cosmic modem that downloads the sky. They connect what happens in the sky with place and time and direction here on earth in a dramatic, precise and content rich revelation in light. So the meridian is not then just an instrument or a concept. It is a stage and the, uh, the universe performs on it daily. And uh, I am headed out to the Gottlieb Transit Corridor now and will join you out there in just a few minutes. Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Krupp. Um, it's exceptionally informative, interesting, and I'm sure we've generated a bunch of interest for folks to come up here and see it for themselves. So I wanna let you know that right now we are generally only open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And you need to prove that you're vaccinated if you're 12 years and older. If you're 18 and older, you need to bring an ID to prove who you are as well. So if you plan on visiting. Now I have some bad news if you wanna visit this week. We're actually closed this Friday and Saturday. We will be open on Sunday, however. Um, check the website as always to verify all this information in case anything changes. Um, of course, we're in a rapidly changing time right now. We have to follow all the city uh, rules and things like that, such as the vaccine check. But we love it when you come visit us and you can see the Meridian Arc in action for yourself. Um, although you're going to see it virtually, of course, here in just a few minutes um, when Dr. Krupp gets down to the Meridian Arc. Um, and once again, this presentation is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, the City of Los Angeles, and the Department of Recreation and Parks. And we also would like to thank Griffith Observatory Foundation, which is our nonprofit partner in all that we do. They make so much of our programming available to the, to the public, uh, provide equipment to us. They provide um, even the uh, salaries of our 
part-timers that run our school program. They provide that so that we do not have to charge an admission fee for our kids that come to our in-person or our virtual school program, our online school program that we're currently running. Um, so we thank everybody that makes all the donations as you do this. And again, once again, today um, is the first day of winter in the Northern Hemisphere. It is the first day of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Hello, Blake, if you've tuned in down there in Australia, one of our former employees is down there now, helping run telescopes. Um, but it's interesting, when you're down in the Southern Hemisphere, other things happen too. I don't know if you notice it, but the moon seems to be upside down. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but in addition to the seasons being reversed, the moon is reversed as well. It looks like it's upside down when you're down there, which is just kind of crazy, um, a lot of fun. Other things that are happening in the uh, world of astronomy, of course, I hope you're all paying attention to the upcoming launch of the James Webb Space Telescope that's supposed to happen on December 24th. So fingers crossed, that's the next big space telescope that we're sending out into space to make observations. Um, it's headed out to an L2 position, which is a little back away from the earth. It's not just gonna stay in orbit around the earth like the Hubble Space Telescope did. So a lot of steps to come on that in a very, very exciting time. But um, you know, between now and our next All Space Considered broadcast, which is our premier uh, space news program that we run here at Griffith Observatory, myself, Patrick So, Chris Butler, and Katie Flynn, uh, we all uh, take part in that and bring you a monthly First Friday event. And we're very excited about the one coming up in January. We're going to look back at all the major events in astronomy that happened back then. And we're going to uh, look forward to some of the things coming in the next year. Um, so it'll be a fun show. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk probably Mars in February. And then in March, we're going to have a very special guest with us um, as well. So look forward to that. Check our website and you can enjoy those programs. So, Patrick, do you think we're going to have any sunshine here for our Meridian Arc? It's, it's, it's off and on. So it, it makes this uh, planning for the, uh, for the transit very difficult uh, uh, for us. I mean, it, it would have been clear cut with our plans if it was clear, 100%. But, uh, but we'll see. Um, th there are breaks in the clouds and we might get lucky. Um, otherwise, we have plan B, which will be revealed. Uh, should it be cloudy so yeah indeed and then of course tonight <clears throat> we will also be bringing you uh, another event where we're going to come to you live and bring you the sunset from Griffith Observatory so that's going to be a lot of fun as well so we hope you join us then um, we'll go live at um, 4 30 we'll start the stream this evening we'll talk a little bit again about what it means to be a solstice and what's happening there and then we'll watch the sunset and uh, the sun on the solstice sets in a particular direction. We've actually marked a line out on our sunset terrace that indicates where it's supposed to go down. And if we're, if it's clear and we have biggest ones in our solar system uh, there's the the planet Saturn that's visible just above um, uh, Venus and then much higher up uh, which is much brighter the planet Jupiter and weather permitting uh, we hope to bring you telescopic views of uh, of these planets uh, tonight uh, which uh, will happen uh, shortly after uh, after sunset and after we've observe the uh, winter solstice sunset with, uh, with David. Yeah, this is something we've been doing at each of the, the equinoxes and the solstices for about the last year. It was a year ago that there was the great conjunction and we had that beautiful view of Jupiter and Saturn in the same field of view. Um, you can still go back and watch that if you like, it's on our YouTube channel. It was really a fantastic event. 
tonight, nothing quite that spectacular, but you know, anytime I get to see Saturn, anytime I get to see Jupiter through a telescope, it's a win. So we're very much hoping we get a break in the clouds for tonight, in addition to a break in the clouds in just moments. Now, I'm assuming we're going to get an indication here that Dr. Krupp is ready to go down there at the, uh, at the Gottlieb Transit Corridor when he's down there. I know that we're close to that time now. So we're awaiting the indication from our tech folks that he's good to go. I'm sure we'll see the picture show up down there when he's good to go. Um, and once again, local noon happens right around 11.52. So we have a few minutes to go. Um, I'm seeing our tech crew bring up the audio here, and I think they're ready to switch over. Let's see if they are. Dr. Krupp, are you there? Maybe I'm not Dr. Ed yet. Krupp again here now in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor on the west exposure of Griffith Observatory, and the cosmos is toying with us today. The sun is out there. There are a lot of clouds out there, and frankly, over the next few minutes, I don't think any of us can tell whether this is going to work or not. But because this is Griffith Observatory, there will be local noon. Let me go back to the Gottlieb Transit Corridor, though, for a moment. The, those words are, are absolutely essential to understanding what this place is. Now, Gottlieb is pretty straightforward. The Gottlieb Transit Corridor is named after Robert and Suzanne Gottlieb, who made a major contribution for the renovation and expansion of Griffith Observatory, which was completed in 2006. And corridor is pretty easy to figure out as well. It's a corridor. There's a glass wall on one side and a glass wall on the other. And as you walk up and down, you're walking in a corridor. Uh, transit's a little trickier. Uh, in astronomy, transit can mean several things, uh, but here, transit means, as, as we've broadcast already so far in our performance today, uh, transit refers to the passage of a celestial object across the local meridian. And the local meridian is embedded in the ground right here in the transit corridor. There's a bronze line that runs from the south end all the way to the north end and the stairs at the, at the far north. And so, as I mentioned earlier, everybody has heard of the Greenwich Meridian, but right here, this is the Griffith Meridian, and this is the one that counts today. So you've got the Meridian Line, which is the north-south line, and we get that north-south line only because the sky is moving and turning. It's actually turning because the Earth is spinning on its axis, but it looks to us as though it's the sky turning, and it all appears to be turning around the North Pole of the sky. If you were, in fact, to look down at the far end and see the banister at night and then sight on the banister from the bottom, that banister would point straight up to the North Star and to the North Celestial Pole, the point around which all things in the sky are turning. Well, that, in fact, is what makes north. We wouldn't have north if it weren't for that behavior of earth and sky. And as a consequence, we've established a whole system of directions. They're called cardinal directions that uh, we use to orient ourselves in, in the landscape. The sun transits the meridian line every day, of course, and that's at local noon. And as I mentioned earlier, AM is just anti-meridian before the meridian, and PM is just post-meridian after the meridian. At local noon, the sun is on the meridian, and as it is on the meridian, it's at its highest elevation in the sky. That elevation in the sky then allows us to measure where we are in the year with the meridian arc that's inside the transit corridor. The transit corridor's meridian arc is inscribed with the dates of the year, with the constellations of the zodiac, and also with some marks uh, that indicate key times of the year. Well, the reason it works like this is really quite straightforward. The black monolith at the south end of the transit corridor has a stainless steel foil attached to it, and the hole up in the top of that foil is what's allowing the light of the sun to pass through. And it produces a spot of light and we can actually pick up the spot of light now on the top of the meridian arc. It's very faint because of the clouds, it's diffuse, and it's hard to know if it's going to do everything we want it to, but in fact, it is marking 
It's marking the date up there, the 21st, and as that spot of light reaches the sensors, uh, it, it should be connected to the ecliptic chart to activate uh, the lights. The lights on the ecliptic chart have just lighted up. The sun has lighted up. It shows where the sun is among the constellations of the nighttime sky. Those stars are up there now, even though you can't see them because the sun is so bright. But for everybody who's watching on Griffith Observatory television and everybody who's watching from Griffith Observatory today, let me tell you, we lucked out. The clouds were terrible, but we have local noon at Griffith Observatory on schedule. And as a special, as a special treat for all of you who are here in place and uh, with those who are online as well, we do something else very crucial at winter solstice at Griffith Observatory. We have to, in fact, switch the year around. Now, what in the world does Griffith Observatory have that allows that to go to take place? Well, if you think about it for a second, June is marked down here and December is up there. So the sun has to move July to December and then from December back down to June. The question is, how does the meridian arc know which stars to light up, whether it's going the upside or the downside? And the answer to that is we have a switch. And now we throw the switch so the thing works for the next half of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, some drum roll, please. Griffith Observatory has preserved cosmic order for the world once again. Thank you very much. Dr. Krupp, that was a fantastic local noon. Once again, the fact that we had a sun, the clouds broke just long enough, the sun was strong enough, we didn't even have to go to our, our backup source of illumination that we had ready to go. Um, it's always a, always a fun event when there's a little bit of drama involved. And we certainly had that today. We weren't sure whatsoever if we were going to be able to see that or not. So once again, we celebrated local noon here on the first day of winter. That spot of sunlight will start working its way back up the arc now. And if you come visit Griffith Observatory, you can see that for yourself. Like I said before, we are open this weekend. We will only be open on Sunday. So don't try and come and, come and see us on Friday or Saturday. But if you want to come see the Meridian Arc for yourself, come on up on Sunday and uh, you can see, experience it. You can see it happen for yourself. Um, make sure you do bring proof of vaccination. And if you're over 18, make sure you bring your identification card with you as well. We need to prove who you are. This is a city ordinance and we are a city facility. Griffith Observatory is owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles and the Department of Recreation and Parks. So um, we appreciate everybody that's joined us here today. Um, it's been a really fantastic local noon once again, and we really are looking forward to experiencing sunset. I think if, if we're lucky, we're supposed to have a little clear patch tonight. So, uh, you know, tune back in this evening or this late afternoon and we'll experience our, our sunset. Uh, Patrick, what are your thoughts on the, the local noon today? I, I just feel that winter is here already. <laughs> 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 yeah, it sure feels like it is. Winter is here. And, uh, you know, it just we have to be ready for it uh, here in Los Angeles. Those cold 50 degree uh, days will be here any moment. Uh, not, not to make fun of anybody that's experiencing some true cold, but we actually had some frost on the ground uh, rather recently. And uh, just because it's getting cold um, doesn't mean it won't get warm again. These things are cyclic. We experience and celebrate the seasons here at Griffith Observatory. We mark the time and mark the moments using our instruments. The building itself has a lot of instruments built into it, such as our sundial, our meridian arc. And of course, we have wonderful telescopes here. Every night that it is clear and we're open, we have telescopes that are free for you to come take a look at. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks to our Griffith Observatory Foundation, our nonprofit partner in the city of LA and all our members that uh, help and support us. And thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Krupp. And we'll see you all later this afternoon when we celebrate the sunset on this winter solstice at Griffith Observatory. Thank you, everybody.